You're listening to the MindPod Network. Friends and travelers, you can support the It's All Happening podcast by heading on over to ZachLeary.com and using the Amazon portal to buy your stuff, or head on over to iTunes and leave this podcast a review. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. Welcome to the podcast, friends and travelers, mystics and psychonauts. Welcome to the It's All Happening podcast. I'm Zach Leary. This is the show. I'm your host. So happy that you're here. Episode 116. This week on the show, we have a return guest, Phil Goldberg, author, speaker, spiritual counselor, modern mystic living among us here in Los Angeles, California. He is also the author of a new book called The Life of Yogananda, the story of the yogi who became the first modern guru. So we'll get into that in a second. Um, But I want to take a minute to point out a couple of milestones that are very, very significant in the unfolding history of mankind in the Western world that both occur in April 2018. April 2018 marks the anniversary of two very separate and very different milestones in American history, Um, but both of them have uh, historical significance rooted in the 1960s. The first, uh, April 4th, 2018, marks the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., now, this is obviously very, very somber and something to, uh, you know, take pause in and really consider uh, the breadth and importance of the work that Martin Luther King did during his time. There's a fantastic new documentary on HBO called King in the Wilderness, which I highly encourage everybody to check out. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. <laughs> lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country. Maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they have committed themselves to that over that. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That, of course, is an excerpt from the very last public speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave in Memphis, Tennessee on April 3rd, 1968, the day before he was assassinated after taking part in the sanitation workers' strike in Memphis. 
And if you go and listen to that whole speech, just go to YouTube and, uh, you know, type in Martin Luther King Jr.'s last speech and watch the whole thing. It is extraordinary. And it is so prophetic uh, that he was, uh, you know, deliberating and making peace with his very own incarnation and his existence and the very nature of life itself. And he knew that quite possibly his days were numbered. But what is so extraordinary about this speech, and also if you see that documentary as well, is it brings up there's kind of this central theme that is being explored uh, around the sickness that is racism in America. And the question was asked, is America too sick to be healed? Is the very nature of America too sick to be healed from the very disease that is eating it alive? Very interesting, worth pondering, and I, I highly recommend that. So turning the page a little bit and going to the other end of the spectrum of a very, very important milestone of the 20th century. On April 19th, 1943, Dr. Albert Hoffman became the first person to intentionally experience the psychedelic effects of LSD. That's right, April 2018 marks the 75th anniversary of the first LSD experiences. Dr. Hoffman first discovered its effects in 1943, and LSD quickly became recognized for its possible therapeutic efforts. So anybody who knows anything about the 1960s or pop culture or um, even you know modern counterculture knows that the permutation, the dissemination of LSD went far beyond the possible therapeutic benefits and made its way into the hearts, minds, and collective consciousness of millions and millions of travelers in the Western world. And, you know, this uh, uh, very rapid adoption of LSD use uh, in America and England and many countries in the 1960s happened at such a, a, a fast pace that there is, uh, it's, it's very apparent if you go back and, and look at the historical record of pre-LSD and post-LSD, you can see the effect that it had on our world very, very quickly through our music, through our art, through our fashion, through our attitudes about race and sex and the ecology and politics. Um, it's no question it's one of the, the great spiritual, cultural, and psychotherapeutic milestones of our time. So the 75th anniversary is going on now. And if you go to maps.org, you can dive into their portal of 75 years of experiences discovering LSD, some very good stuff there. So just like Dr. King was uh, one of the most iconic figures of our time, uh, but with the majority of his work taking place in the 1960s, LSD no doubt had its biggest, uh, you know, the widest opening of Pandora's box also in the 60s. So April 2018, highly charged for these milestones. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by the Beatles. I think we can get away with using 20 seconds of that song. So as we get into the podcast, Phil Goldberg, author of the book, The Life of Yogananda, the story of the yogi who became the first modern guru. So when Yogananda landed on the shores of Boston in 1920 and made his way, you know, really roared into the roaring 20s through Boston and then New York and then made his way out west, he created, uh, set forth on a path that had not yet been uh, embarked on in America. 
His book, The Autobiography of a Yogi, is one of the most uh, famous books on uh, not just mysticism and the spiritual path, but it's also one of the most famous you know, autobiographies of all time, millions and millions of copies printed. Um, so, you know, the effect that Yogananda had uh, in on America, you know, makes for such fertile soil and such a f- an amazingly rich ecosystem for Phil to uh, um, write this this book on um, the life of Yogananda, and he really, really uh, sheds. Uh, Steepak Chopra said, "I'll just read that." Sheds new light on the incredible story and illuminates the forces that made Yogananda a spiritual teacher and role model for the ages. Um, you know, especially in Los Angeles, you know, so many people go to Lake Shrine and just hang out there and maybe not really even know much about, uh, you know, Yogananda, the person who founded that center. So I highly encourage you to uh, check out the book. And on April 15th, Phil has an event at Tantras Yoga. And pre-order the book now at Phil Goldberg, philipgoldberg.com, excuse me. And you can pre-order it now and get a kind of a free gift to go along with that. So we're going to spend the whole podcast talking about Paramahansa Yogananda, one of the great mystics who took America by storm in the 20s through the 50s. Enjoy. Phil Goldberg, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Zach. It's great to be here. So, uh, so happy to to have you have you back as a as a return guest. Fantastic. <laughs> and this time, you know, usually when I when I do podcasts, I shouldn't say usually, but most of the time, it's uh, it's not a, a specific subject. You know, it's sort of a far reaching conversation. About, we can go right? anywhere. So. Yes, yes, we can. Well, I think Paramahansa Yogananda thought the same thing. We could go anywhere. Life is but a dream, right? <laughs> a dream within a dream is what, yeah. is what he said. So you're, you've written this book, The Life of Yogananda. Uh, I think it, it's safe to say within, you know, the, the Western interpretation of what yoga is, what an Indian guru is to the layman in the West. Perhaps to not like you and I, I mean, we're sitting in front of an altar right now, but to people who really aren't on this path, Yogananda is probably the most famous of them all. I think even among uh, yogis, yes. he would probably be the best known, except for people's own gurus, right. but in terms of the general uh, environment of spiritual seekers and practicing yogis and uh, people on meditation paths and and the general public, he's probably the best known of all the gurus who came, which is pretty remarkable given that he died in 1952. Right. And he died at, how old was he? 59. Yeah, he was quite young. Uh, and I do want to talk about his death because that's one of his the aspects. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's a fascinating yeah, yeah. Uh, footnote of, of his life. Um, so, writing the book and doing all that research, why do you think that is? Why do you think he is? What, what is it about him that made it that? There are a few reasons. Um, in. Yeah, in not in order, but uh, I'll save the I think the most important one for last. First, um, he was the first of the Indian gurus to make America his home. There were gurus before him, and the, the great precedent and role model of uh, Swami Vivekananda, who left a great legacy, but uh, a, a generation earlier, but. Um, he, he was only here himself for a short period of time. Vivekananda. Vivekananda. Yes, right. Yogananda came in 1920, and except for 18 months when he traveled back to India and, and Europe, uh, he was here. And he made L.A. his home. And so he has a footprint in America, especially in Southern California, where they have... You know, I always say he had the best real estate karma of all the gurus. They have these fabulous locations like the Lake Shrine here and Encinitas and all that. And so he's a visible presence uh, in in America. And and in the 32 years he he was here, 
um, he reached a tremendous number of people. I mean, it was pretty remarkable when I went back and followed his uh, career of public events. Mm -hmm. You know, it started out small, and then, you, you know, then he was filling Carnegie Hall and L.A. Philharmonic and Boston right. Symphony Hall and all that. Mm -hmm. And so they reached a lot of people. And um, he left behind a functioning organization and leadership that uh, seemed to know what they were doing in carrying on the legacy. And they've, you know, Self-Realization Fellowship, which he started, uh, continues to this day. And they still reach a lot of people, new people, with their lessons and their uh, initiations for advanced students and so on and so forth. And there are a couple of breakaway organizations like Ananda that um, reach a certain number of people on an ongoing basis. And the fact that the methodologies that he brought from India, his Kriya, Kriya Yoga lineage, those uh, methods work. They have a transformative effect on people's lives. The written work that he left behind holds up and makes sense to people. Absolutely. And so there's a, you know, the sort of pragmatic American uh, ideal that is, you know, one of the main reasons that all the different aspects of yoga have caught on here because they work. Yes. That applies to him as well. But the main reason, I think, is autobiography of a yogi. Right. I mean, that is the yeah. right, seminal book. It, it's... Yeah. It is indeed a seminal book. Yeah. It's iconic at this point, you know, and when you think about it, yeah. not many gurus, not many um, people who are considered holy men, especially monastics, write about their personal lives. Right. They just don't very often. And so this had, this autobiography was engaging and... Um, very revealing. Uh, rev yes, to a certain extent. Yeah. And, you know, filled with beautiful, wonderful, exotic India stuff, yogic, you know, miraculous stuff, all that. And it's still popular. It still sells. And yeah. so you go to yoga studios, you even health food stores, places like that, and you'll see copies of it. And that means his face right. is front and center. So of all the gurus, he's probably best known for that reason. And I'm going to add one thing because of your connection. Yeah. When I was uh, interviewing people for my previous book for American Veda, yeah. and I would ask them what got them on their path, of, you know, um, if they mentioned a book, it was most likely to be Autobiography of a Yogi. What do you think was mentioned second? Be Here Now. Be Here Now. Right. But when I interviewed Ram Dass, he mentioned Autobiography <laughs> of a Yogi. So. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, yeah, I... I before Be Here Now came in, the explosion of Eastern spirituality was um, your book so brilliantly uh, uncovers. I mean, in the 60s, I mean, there only was, you know, the Gospels of Sri Ramakrishna. And, well, there was and also Alan Watts, Alan Watts and Aldous yeah. Huxley, and we just started to get translations of the Gita, you know, become available, and things were, you know, circulating. But there, there wasn't very much, yeah. No, Auto, there wasn't. Autobiography of a Yogi is one of those, uh, you know, pieces of Eastern mysticism that has uh, transcended genre. That's right. I mean, you know, there are, uh, I mean, I've seen kids in high school write book reports on. That's who have, right. Who have no interest on in this path at all. It's just an interesting cultural. I I was, uh, some visiting guru, a modern guru, was uh, in town when I was researching American Veda, and I interviewed some of his um, devotees. And one young guy, I asked him, you know, how he got on his path. He was in some podunk town in the Midwest and found the autobiography of a yogi in the public library. I mean, that changed his life. And that sort of thing has happened over and over and, and over and over again. again. Well, I, uh, an aspect of that, which I'm, I'm curious to, to ask you about, to talk about, um, I mean, the success of autobiography of a yogi and him being, you know, the first Indian, you know, guru Swami to actually take up residence in America. I have this perception of Yogananda that when he started settling in in America, and especially when he went west, 
that he was pretty savvy about the changing landscape of American media. Quite right. And how to use it. Quite right. Yeah, like that booming voice that he put on the records. This is Swami Yogananda. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was, it was, <laughs> right? I, Paramahansa Yogananda, I'm praying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, but bear in mind, there were no recordings until later in his, oh, right, in right. his okay. time. But he did, he did radio. He did radio. Right. That's right. Yeah. He, but to me, mm-hmm. and, and you're, you're absolutely dead on. Yeah. And to me, one of the uh, hallmarks of all the successful gurus, regardless of when they came, was this ability to understand the culture they're in. This new culture, right. vastly different, especially in 1920s, from India. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the Roaring Twenties, and he came from you know India, still under the thumb of the colonial empire, right. and um, here he was in a new world that he knew about vaguely, but he had to adapt. So they all have this ability to adapt the language maybe invent new delivery systems and uh, what they emphasize when they give their uh, discourses and their teachings. And his adaptability was fabulous. I mean, it was really exemplary. And you could see it in, like, even if you just look at the titles of his lectures over time, you see he's learning what what makes Americans tick. Ah, right. So at a certain point, it might be... Uh, how to achieve success through, you know, yoga or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and uh, pragmatic, he's, he gets what the America's word success. about. Success. Success yes. or right. better relationships or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, you know, he, he learned yeah. to adapt the message. Yeah. But they all, the successful ones, do it without distorting the teachings that they represent. Right. So you adapt the language, you shift the focus a little bit, but you don't compromise on the teachings themselves, and you make sure that um, you give people a sense that whatever you talk about that day, there's even, there's more. Right. There, that this is not just a, a self-help program, but there's more. But the other thing he did was adapt, as you said, to the technology. So radio was part of it. Radio was mm-hmm. in its infancy when he first arrived. Sure. And um, and of course travel. Although he yeah. always he always traveled by train. He didn't like flying. Right. And um, but the delivery system. So one of the early things he did was recognize that if he's going to reach a lot of people, he you can't just do it in this sort of guru disciple one on one teaching the way it was always on, done in India. Put on a show. <laughs> so he created correspondence courses where he put some of his basic teachings, sort of elemental, foundational teachings, yeah. in a, a mail order form. Now that, That's in amazing. the 1920s, yeah. was new technology. Right. You clip a coupon, you send it in, Someone packages up what's coming to you, and they sent it to Amazing. you. Amazing! It's the first online course. So it was right. like the Sears, you know, Sears Roebuck yeah. had pioneered that for goods and merchandise, and now they were doing it, and they still do it right. that way. They still haven't put it online. You how, know, how did he get that? How did it, how did that occur to him? I don't know whether it, that in particular was something. Someone suggested, some yeah. savvy American who you know knew, it, maybe it was like, how can I reach more people right. and not have to you know, be instructing people one-on-one or in, traveling constantly and seeing one group? And so, mm-hmm. well, you could, he, maybe he knew about mail That's order amazing. or whatever it was. He introduced the correspondence course, right. and it was not without controversy among traditionalists uh, you know, who said, hey, you can't do that. You know, but the, all the gurus who came to the West did it. You know, right. uh, in the '60s, especially. You know, right. they were training teachers of yoga and meditation, and and uh, you know, and traditionalists would say, "But they're not Brahmins, right? Of course. Or you can't teach women oh to do these things." Yeah. And so, you know, they bucked. They were uh, resourceful, 
and they, in Yogananda's case, you know, willing to be innovative and willing to uh, function well, as a kind of reformer, but with it, but also at the same time very faithful to tradition. And I mean, within the West, especially, I mean, these days in India too, especially in the modern age, but in the West back then, especially the institutionalization of these gurus' teachings was very fundamental to their success. Sure. Like, you know, a huge part of like the like the Hare Krishna movement, for example, in ISKCON was that it was very well organized. You know, and uh, you know, Prabhupada didn't need to be everywhere, like same thing. Right. They could sort of spread ISKCON around as right. an institution. And SRF here could just be That's right. really good at and, setting it and, up. And and to do that right. you need devotees followers, disciples, who you could right. train properly to mm. represent the teachings in an appropriate way and trust them and so forth. And, and that was part of their skill, you know, they did that. So in, in doing this, um, and I, I, wanna, I want you to correct me if, if I'm wrong in this, but I've always thought that, you know, part of the, the you know, the success to his formula, and also the same with uh, Vivekananda as well with uh, Vedanta Society really taking up roots in Southern California mm-hmm. was the going west. Like Yogananda first yeah. came, came to Boston. That's right. And, and you know, that was in Carnegie Hall, and those were big like gigs. But the East Coast was still rooted in, you know, puritanical kind of and Catholicism. And it didn't really want the Hindu thing. Like as Not much, to the same right? degree. Not to the same but degree. But it caught on. He, he it, was successful there. Yeah. He was, right? Okay. Yeah. But you're but, right. Yeah, I mean, there's something about the there's West. There's something about L.A. Yes. In, and San Francisco to a lesser right. degree because it's a smaller town. But you're right about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, Vivekananda also started in Boston, you know, well, really in Chicago, but yeah. he, he actually was in Boston as well. And first center, first Vedanta Society was in New York. Okay. And, but then the, the transmission... Hmm of his work came, you know, 50 years after he was here. There were Vedanta societies in New York and Boston and here and there. But it, the real transmission that came when Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood were involved with him, sure. that came from L.A. Right. And um, yeah, Yogan, really in Yogananda's case, uh, actually, you know, I looked, you know, as you know, I've looked into all the gurus. They all had a presence in L.A. Sure. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, you know, the, the, the Beatles made him worldwide famous, in, you know, in 67 and 68. Yeah. But he started here in yeah. L.A., you know, and, and got things off the ground here. And again, Prabhupada at one point wanted to make Los Angeles the Eskon headquarters. Is that right? Yeah, at one point, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's just like this, you know, the West being this was, new land. Yes, where and I had to, in, when, in writing yeah. The Life of Yogananda, I had to look into that because, you know, there was a reason he decided to settle here. And, it, you know, there's first, obviously the weather here is more like India than, you know, Boston or New York well, is. Sure, right. But um, <laughs> he kind of had the sense that about something about L.A. even before he got here. And, uh, and he called it the Benares of America. And, you know, the joke is, you know, if you go to Benares, it's all about, you know, life on the Ganges. Right. Well, there's no, yeah, there's no Ganges here. There's no here. burning God there. <laughs> but the, there was something about the feeling here and the, the experimental nature of the population, the creativity, uh, the openness and even in the 20s, it was a place where, like, new thought took off and new religions and new metaphysical thinkers would come and people would move here to reinvent themselves. So something about L.A. has be it's, it's a kind of um, uh, transmitting station for these ideas coming from the East and then going elsewhere. So in, in that model and in that thinking, what is it about Yogananda's teachings? Now, getting into the actual, the specific teachings, not just his charisma or his bhava, but what is it about his teachings that were able to take shape in the West? Well, I think the same thing that applies to all the other 
lineages of you know the Vedic tradition, uh, you know, because you know so many branches uh, of it took root here, and what the successful ones had in common was uh, ideas that held up to reason, that were in, they were compatible to science, mm -hmm. to evidence, to the facts of history, unlike what a lot of people think of as religion and, and you know, superstitious, superstition-based or faith-based religion. So they held up, and that appealed to, you know, sort of um, sense of uh, the Western world as uh, this uh, uh, bastion of reason and logic and scientific uh, method. Mm -hmm. And the methods themselves work. You know, he has all he had. He introduced a repertoire of teachings under the name uh, Kriya Yoga that involve meditative practices and uh, breathing practices and devotional practices, a number of them, yeah. plus a kind of physical uh, system that he is now called energization exercises that he kind of invented that have some of the qualities of Hatha Yoga, uh, right. some of the benefits of Hatha Yoga built into it and physical exercise. So it, it was a, 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 a repertoire of teachings, not unlike what the other gurus introduced, because, you know, people may or may not realize this, but there are, uh, there's a vast inventory of yogic practices, yes. you know, dozens and dozens of different forms of meditation, and hundreds of forms of pranayama, you know, different schools of hatha yoga. I mean, there's so much, and so different uh, teachers from different traditions introduced their own methods, and they got followers for whom the, those were appealing. And so, but they all had that in common that the the methods work. If they didn't. If people's lives weren't changed by his work, he could have been as charismatic as, you know, anybody who ever lived and as beloved, but, you know, wouldn't have endured the same way. Sure. Because, you know, you take something up, and you say, oh, I love this book, or I heard this guy speak, and he, you know, I want to just be around him and all that sort of stuff, except for the people for whom a, a, a guru-disciple relationship would be the path, yes. the rest of us, you know, it's like, okay, well, well, give me something to do, You'll lose and interest. if it works, I'll keep doing right. it. Right. Yeah, there's <laughs> actually something there. That's right. Yes, right. With Otherwise, it's like, well, he was nice, and next time he oh. comes around, I'll go get another, uh, or like Alma. Alma comes around now, and then yeah. people go see her once a year, get their hug, get their darshan, yeah. but the ones who... Uh, are really involved with her teachings do the practices right. that she recommends. And he, he westernized a lot of it. Like, what, you know, when I go to a, an SRF, um, you know, Sunday service or something today, <laughs> I, I'm always kind of, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of taken aback that so much of it's in English. Oh, well, yes, that's for sure. You know, and a lot of the music. I mean, the music is, yes, yes and, I know, I know and, what you mean. You, being a, a kirtan wala and stuff. Yeah, I'm, you I'm prefer a, the, the Sanskrit. Yeah, and I'm, you know, <laughs> yeah, I prefer the Sanskrit also because of how I've been taught about the power of Sanskrit, but whatever. I mean, and I love Yogananda Fine and everything. Yeah. But I do get a little taken aback by that, and I'm like, well, God, why is that? Why well, did he do that? I thought you were going someplace else, but uh, we can talk about I want to know where you we thought can it was talk about. No, I thought you were going to say, as many people have, they, they go to a, a Yogananda-related uh, place, mm -hmm. SRF or one of the smaller ones, on a Sunday morning, and it looks like a Presbyterian church. Well, there's that too. Yes. Hindutarian. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> that as well. and, and it's true. <laughs> yes. You know, he was no dummy. You know, one that, well, of yeah, that's exactly. He was no dummy. It was that an was adaptable thing. He adapted. You, yes. It didn't take long for him to realize 
well, he also was, he, he was very well versed in the Christian tradition because of the missionaries in India, yeah, and he yes. went to a, 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 a missionary co the, Scottish, the Scottish rights thing, right? uh, yeah. school. Uh, well, I mean, that's it. It doesn't college. feel very Indian to me going to SRF. No, you go to an... You go to SRF, uh, SRF or any of the others on a Sunday morning, mm -hmm. and it it looks more like a church. There might be pews or folding chairs, but right. it, it's lined up like that. There's you know somebody at a podium right. giving a sermon. There's the equivalent of hymns, only they're usually devotional songs that Yogananda wrote and composed, right. or traditional ones that he rendered into English. Um, so and not the music, Hare Krishna. No, it's not right. Hare Krishna. Yeah. It's not uh, Krishna Das or Jai Uttal, yeah. That's for sure. It's, yeah. it, it does not rock and roll. It's very staid and yeah. very conservative musically, which some people love and some people mm. prefer. You know, I have to, I, at the risk of sounding cynical, someone once called it uh, Lawrence Welk uh, <laughs> Kirtan. But you know, it's it's. Um, it has a conservative sort of yes. feel. And there's a sermon, and there's even a collection box. It's like a church. Right. And he even called his place, places uh, churches at, at a certain point because he was adapting. Now, you could say, is that a cynical ploy you know, to play on Americans? Or did he just realize, hey, Americans get religious on Sunday morning. Right. So let's have Sunday services. We won't call them satsangs. We'll call them Sunday services. He's giving the people what they want. And that's, yes. that's when people will show up. Right. But if you listen to what's said, it's straight on yes. Vedanta philosophy or yogic philosophy, yes. often in a sort of Christianized language. Because, it, you know, and if you look at the altar, you see Jesus up there along with Krishna and his lineage of gurus. Yes. Because, you know, that's one of the other factors of Yogananda's uh, popularity and success. All the gurus who came here had a friendly attitude toward all religions. You know, that's, it was like, we welcome everybody. We're not here to convert you. You don't have to be a Hindu. You don't have to be a Buddhist. True, I we, Vedanta. It's all what's that? It's Pure true. Vedanta. All Vedanta. paths are fine. Here's some teachings that will help you in your way. Yes. If you're a good Christian, you could be a better Christian, so on and so forth, which is one of the reasons for the success. The other is, it, this is a predominantly Christian country. Um, they're all very friendly when it comes to Jesus. You know, he's held in the highest regard in India as, you know, a great either an avatar or just a great holy man, you know, a sadguru. And so all the lineages will honor him. Some go even further, and they make him almost like part of the lineage. And that's what Yogananda did. Yogananda's guru, Sri Yukteswar, was very well versed in the Bible and in Christianity. And, you know, he talked a lot and wrote about the uh, commonalities in between his in Hindu tradition and uh Christianity as he interpreted it. Mm -hmm. And Yogananda took that to another extreme. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of his commentaries about Jesus and the New Testament. Yeah, I've got someone over there a whole bunch. Yeah. yeah. And there's a, you know, a two-volume collection, of, well, it's a two-volume book about based on his writings and teachings about Jesus. Yeah, so amazing. he felt he was here not just to bring the uh, true yogic teachings, but what he called original Christianity. Right. So he was reinterpreting, it as, as Americans look at it, that right. as well. So, you know, it wasn't that big a stretch. But <laughs> did, did he have any pushback uh, on, on doing that? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, from Christians for whom... You know, his interpretation yeah. would have been... But all the, all the gurus had some pushback from conservative Christians, even if they never mentioned Jesus. Right. They were, you know, they're teach, preaching false religion and, you know, stay away. These are... You are a false I mean, There was a big yeah. anti-Swami thing in the 20s and 30s because, you know, there were other teachers yeah. around. Yogananda was the most famous, and he, as he, as I said, was the one who made L.A., you know, America's headquarters. But the Swamis from the Vedanta Society was here. Right. Hatha Yoga gurus would come and go. 
And uh, the local swamis from the Vedanta Society were, you know, there was a lot of fear around them. These were dark-skinned heathen. Yes. I know worshippers. Yes. And whose main followers usually were women, just like today's yoga scene. So, right. you know, people were... But even today, you go to, a, a, like, the Festival of Chariots, you know, when the, the Hare Krishnas, the ISKCON movement, does their thing in Venice every year. You know, all those protesters who come out every yeah. year yeah. and get very combative. And, oh, yeah. yeah. Everyone, yeah. every guru who came, especially in yeah. the 60s when, you know, people of the hippie generation were flocking to gurus instead of to, you know, their churches and synagogues. So about the, the, the actual, uh, you know, guru, um, I guess, I don't want to call it label, but the guru embodiment of, of Yogananda and him actually being a guru, uh, what was his, when he was in America and kind of traveling, you know, in L.A. and Encinitas and all of, you know, this stuff and really taking up refuge here, uh, what was his, how could you access him? Could you, was he accessible? Yeah, much and, more than you would think. And you could take Up his until darshan. a certain point. Mm -hmm. He was front and center, and he spent a good deal of his first say, 15 years. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could think of his time in America, which lasted from 1920 until 1952, in two parts. There was 1920 to 1935. In 35, then he left. He went to in Europe and India right. for 18 months, a year in India, uh, traveling around Europe. And then the period from 36 to 52 after he returns. Mm -hmm. That first part, he was traveling all the time. He was on the road. He was, you know, one of my chapters in the book is called Road Warrior because that's he was just moving around a lot. He missed, he loved Christmas, but he missed Christmas at home here in L.A. for like five years in a row because he was traveling. And, you know, so he was on trains at all time, and, he, you know, his itinerary was unbelievable. He would be lecturing, you know, it would be like, okay, Cleveland, then Buffalo, then Pittsburgh, then, you know, wherever. And wow. he'd stay, and he would give free lectures. Large numbers of people would come, and then those who wanted to take courses where you got instructions and methods— then, you know, people would pay for those, and he would stay and teach. And then after a while, of course, he had to, he couldn't keep doing that. So the correspondence course came, trained teachers filled in the gaps. So he, but he was the guy, he was doing it. And he was, it was personal relationships. And a big part of his, his work in the beginning especially in the very early days in Boston, New York, places like that, was cultivating those relationships with mm -hmm. disciples who he could then trust to carry things on in his absence and run a center and have, you know, classes and all that sort of stuff. And so there were, you know, close disciples and the places where he went, he would be the one teaching and the one going to sal you know people's living rooms to talk to other people and having Amazing. dinner with them and all that yeah. and then as things got bigger and he got older and started to realize you know he didn't want to keep doing this traveling and he wanted to leave behind a written legacy especially the last 10 years or so of his life when he he kind of knew his time was limited and he, he could trust what was going on. He had established centers. He had a magazine. He had books. And he wanted to work on his autobiography and, and other written works that would survive him and carry on the teaching. So that he spent most of those years in L.A., in Southern California, basically, between here and Encinitas. Right. Um, and then he was accessible to the close devotees and students, right. and mu much less so to the, you know, the general public. What was he like? What was his well, personality it's interesting like? because, you know, you, know, you wonder, um, 
I, of course, never met him. Yeah. You know, uh, and there's very few people alive who did. Right. I mean, it's and I really now. got to uh, talk to only one, um, Roy Eugene Davis, who met him when he was 19 in 1949 or something, oh, 48 wow. or 9. And he's still, you know, teaching in Yogananda's name. He has his own small lineage. And um, so just uh, he, his own small lineage broken off from SRF? Yeah, he, he, he essentially left SRF and it's amicable back in the 60s, but, um, uh, or even earlier. But he, um, I got to you know, spend time with him and talk to him, but all the other direct disciples were either inaccessible or dead. And, um, but some of the uh, disciples from the days when he was with them wrote memoirs or essays or had given interviews to other people, yeah. or were correspondents with him, and I had access to a lot of letters and things. So you get a sense of him through them. And um, he, the impression I got uh, you know, was, uh, and, and you have to take this with some, if you're being objective, and yeah, I sure. was, because I'm not a disciple, I'm not a formal student, so I was trying to be as objective as I could. So I'm reading all this stuff knowing that disciples love their guru. Right. And when they write about their guru, it's going to be, it's you know, reverence. he was the greatest and the yeah. best and, the, you know, right. most beloved and uh, so forth. To, to the point of deification sometimes where you, you really have to read things with a grain of, take things with a grain of salt because... It's like people writing about their children, you know, it's right. like they're all the best, you know. <laughs> of course. And um, so, um, but you get a sense of, uh, A, a really, I'd use the word intuitive to put it mildly, but someone with a really tuned in psyche, it was like, you know, because you hear all those stories, of like, he knew what I was thinking. He knew it, you know, he understood me better than, you know, I understood myself. You hear that kind of thing yes. a lot. Right. Um, so you get that, a masterful mind and intellect, uh, an extremely personable guy. He was, he was, you know, there's some recordings of him just having informal conversations with people and he was a great raconteur he told great stories he he had a great sense of humor um and he was incredibly disciplined i mean he really really worked hard yes that you know he took this mission that he was on that he was felt was given to him from his lineage of gurus yeah. to bring these teachings to the west and reach as many people as possible. This was his, you know, this was his work, and he worked very hard at it. But he also seemed very playful. They would do things, you know, they would go on picnics, and they would go to the movies, and they would, you know, have fun and do all these things. And he could also be extremely tough, like gurus tend to be, in, you know, when they're with their closest disciples. They're, they could be disciplinarians. They could be very tough. It could be a lot of tough love. Yes. And, and like, like his guru was to him. His guru really put him through the paces, right. through that ego-busting, you know, shape-up thing. And it's, sadhana, you know, you're doing... Not just yeah, sadhana, but, you know, this. do the work, yeah. you know, don't complain, don't ask questions, you know, obey. Right. And the molding of the mind, the breaking down of egotism, and the building in the sense of surrender, which is something only real close disciples can handle and is, is appropriate for. And you see that in his, in, uh, from those people in, in Yogananda's life, as he was to his guru. Mm -hmm. And he would say, you know, I, you know, some people couldn't handle my being around my guru, but I stuck it out because I knew, you know, he was making me a better person. And, and you see that a lot with Yogananda, too. The other aspect of it that I found interesting and, this, and very moving was he faced a lot of challenges. It was not easy. We have this sense sometimes that, you know, oh, these enlightened people, life is just 
easy and smooth and they nothing bothers it them flows like yeah <laughs> they, river, whatever right? they want yeah. the universe manifests no you know sorry yeah. he and to his credit um he didn't fake that you know he 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 was he had cha- you know, look he was trying to establish an organization in the you know and sustain it through the great depression and the war, right. World War II, and I mean, this is hard. Right. And they were, he was, he was concerned about money issues right up till close to the end. It's like, you know, is there gonna be enough money to sustain this place? Right. Calling on his wealthier disciples to, to bequeath money, you know, and all right. this stuff, and paying the bills, and paying the mortgage early on, and all you know, these, problems of organizational life. He once called organizations hornet's nests. He didn't want to be bothered with that, but his guru mm. said, no, no, I'm sorry, this is your dharma, man. You, you have a mission to uphold and you're not going to be in a cave as, you know, right. or spend your whole life in an ashram. So he struggled. He had lawsuits that he had to deal with. And some of those lawsuits were, fr- you know, front page news stories because there were all kinds of salacious allegations and things going on. And all this he endured, and you see it in his letters, there were periodic times when he just wanted to say, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going back to India. I miss my country. I miss my right. home. And I want to just be a monk. And go off like the sadhus, you know, in the Himalayas and the Ganges and be with God. And I, you know, I can't deal with this anymore. But he always stayed. He stuck it out. Speaking of the lawsuits and the solicitous allegations, he, and getting into his personal life a little bit, uh, essentially he was scandal free. No. No. Well, not accusation free. Not accusation free. I understand that, but but if I, if by if if no, I know not accusation free. But at the end of the day, it seems so. So far as I can tell, right? And and I, you know, I don't know what to expect. We're recording this yep. a couple of weeks before the book actually comes out. Yeah, and I have to say, you know, I really labored over this because there are people to this day, all these years later arguing over incidents that may or may not have occurred in the 1920s and 30s having to do with Yogananda and women. Yeah, sure. And I vowed that I was going to be as objective as I could, yeah. and I gathered as much information as I could. I spoke to you know, the people who think he was a, a reprobate, <laughs> and I have spoke to direct disciples who had access to all of his archives and everything. Mm-hmm. And you come away thinking, well, anything's possible, but I have not really seen convincing evidence right. enough to make you say, yeah, he did those things, They're, the allegations are true. There, it, it really comes down to speculation and hearsay, and I just am not convinced you know, that, that it's a, yeah. you have to be objective about these things. Now, if it were, if I were writing this book, 40 years ago, maybe there would have been more people who had direct knowledge. Sure. But there are none now, and it's all secondary, and it's all speculative and all that. So, there are certain, you know, look, the, the truth is, the private life of any individual right. is never really knowable. Right. So, anything's possible. But some of the allegations I feel comfortable dismissing because yeah. they had to do, they, they were allegations of like, the, the headquarters here in Mount Washington being almost like a harem. Right. That kind of thing that involves numbers of people, right. that doesn't stay secret. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. <laughs> Clandestine love affairs, anything's possible, but I saw no evidence of it, really. Right. No but hard like evidence. The accusation of, of like the harem and, and all of that, that's after a certain point, there's a tipping point to where you cannot keep that. You secret. can't keep, no. Like with somebody's the, going to talk, somebody's going to leave a diary, somebody's going to write letters. Or in like, <laughs> like uh, Muktananda's case, like, yeah. you know, they have those tunnels. That's right. And, you know, they, they're there. Right. You know, so, right. but that doesn't work. So you go by evidence, right. you know, and, um, and I came away thinking, well, I just have not seen convincing evidence that Yogananda ever oh. broke his vows of celibacy. And I mean, so, the, the only kind of, I mean, I wouldn't call it evidence, but the only sort of, uh, 
you know, I guess sweetness in the pot and sort of making that story kind of, you know, come come to life would be, you know, when you first come to America and there he is in the, in the roaring 20s and he's young still. Mm-hmm. He's 27. 27 and he's quite you know, str- oddly beautiful and kind of exotic and it's a tempting time. Hey, uh, you know, I for mean, those of us who lived through the 60s and 70s, yeah, when there were fallen gurus who broke sure. their swami vows. Yeah. Well, you know, I was around. The, you know, women, there was the sexual revolution. Women were in miniskirts and, you know, being provocative. And, 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 they are human beings. And, yes. and the gurus were human beings yeah. with male bodies right. and stuff happened. So the 20s weren't the 60s. Right. But it was still, a, you know, it ro- there was, they call it roaring for a reason. It was the 60s in comparison to how right. the turn of the century That's was. That's right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so it's hard for most of us to imagine a young, vital man staying, re- you know, retaining a vow of celibacy when this <laughs> is going on and you, a lot of your disciples are young women okay. who love you. How do you? How does that happen? It seems to. If you're going to be cynical, you're going to be saying, "No, there's no way that he could have sustained that." I, I take, On the other hand, I take the other road, and it's not even cynicism to me. It's sort of like an a, an embracing and almost like an empathetic sort of like love I have for their humanity. It's like, well, I right, and it makes me think no less of him, to be honest. No, and and me. if I said the same thing, yeah. if he violated his Swami vows and did have love affairs, yeah. it wouldn't make his teachings any less exactly. real. That's right. And I had the same attitude long, long before I took on this project of a biography of Yogananda. I had the same attitude about the gurus of the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. It was, it, you know, the cover-up were issues and the lying was the issues. Lying is, yeah, but, right. you know, I, I remember all that and I thought, well, you know, the it would detract from their, and then even in Yogananda's case, it, 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 if they were, these stories were true, it might detract from the image of him because he was a Swami, he was a monk, right. and he maintained that, and he, he spoke about redirecting you know, sexual energy in, in, the, in the way of uh, you know, the yogic tradition of raising the energy to higher levels right. and... and, and and of the, the okay. virtues of, of abstinence and celibacy and all that, especially for a vow-taking monk. So th- if, if it were true that he had affairs, you, you would say, well, it was hypocritical and uh, he had a fall from grace. Mm-hmm. But it wouldn't make the teachings any right. less true. And, well, you know, but at the same time, I didn't see any convincing evidence that it was that that was the case. And I was wide open to it because, like we just said, it would not have made me think that much less of him. But I just didn't see it. And it's uh, really interesting. And, it, I mean, if anything, it's sort of like it, it would have taken, a, you know, a little slice at sort of his, his the mysticism around him because he comes from a lineage of mystics. I mean, Maha Avatar Babaji, I mean, is... Perhaps the greatest, like true mystic, <laughs> yeah, of, and, of and uh, yeah, legendary, obviously. But yeah, his guru Sri Yukteswar, yes, and Sri Yukteswar's guru Lahiri Mahasya were householders. They were householders. That's right. Lahiri that's right. was a householder. Yeah. Sri Yukteswar was a householder up until a certain point in his life when his wife had died, his his, his daughter had died, his grandchild who he responsible for had grown up and he, that's when he took Swami vows. Ah. But Lahiri was a householder. But he thought he was sent to Yogananda by Babaji, right? He claimed yeah. that. No, that vice versa. That oh. Yogananda was sent to him. Oh, Yogananda was sent to him? Oh. How did that transpire? But the, the meeting was divinely, you know, ordained. And, and how did that uh, transpire? Did you, did you it was one of the fun things to write about was the day they met in Benares. And it's very interesting because there's certain mystery around it but, um, and certain inconsistencies in, you know, different times Yogananda told the story. But essentially they met on the streets of Benares, you know, and 
in the sort of if you've been to Benares, you know, in the streets off the river, these these old windy streets, it's you one know, of the oldest and cities uh, in the world. Hmm? it's one of the oldest cities in the world. Yeah. yeah, and you know now cars try to go through them and all that, but in those days it was foot traffic and rickshaws or whatever, uh, bullocks, and they met you know near the marketplace one day, um, and it, you know there was a, a, a psychic pull and a kind of um, semi-miraculous thing. But it was, it, was, hmm. it was interesting. And one of the interesting things about it was about their early relationship, uh, you know, that um, Sri Teswar says to him, um, yes, okay, I, I, I could take you on as a disciple, but first, go home, finish school. Huh. He didn't want to do that. Right. He did not want to do that. And he got um, a little rebellious, but he came back later, and um, then uh, that's when Sri Yukteswar says, you yeah, know, not only are you not going to stay here at the ashram, but you're going to go finish college, because you're the one who's going to take these teachings to the West, and they'll that's respect right. you more if you go to college. <laughs> So I, I, I do want to talk about Babaji for a second, because now, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's always been the case, but when you go to a, a SRF uh, center and they kind of have the lineage on the wall or something, you'll, you'll see Babaji up at the head there. Um, and my interpretation of, how, of what Babaji was like or what I've read and heard feels, I mean, and you know being... A, a, a spiritual practitioner and you have your own lineage their bobs feel very different to me the bob I mean sort of my, how I interpret sort of the energetic devotional quality of Babaji and of Yogananda they feel very very different to me I don't know if that's just how I interpret it but I mean what I mean it, what's the deal with Babaji from, 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 what, from what you know like what and wasn't there a story that Yogananda crossed paths with him? Yes, right. And is that true? I mean, do you think it's true? I, we only have Yogananda's he word said for he it. He did, though, right? Yeah, okay. it's in the autobiography. He talks right. about Yog, uh, Babaji right. coming to him right. at his home in Garpar Road in right. Calcutta. Uh, when and Babaji would have been 120 at that. Well, point. or 300, 300 and whatever, right, right. you know, depending on. Yeah. Which estimate you uh, you go by, but you know Babaji, the, the you know the way the story goes in Yogananda's lineage is Babaji is this ageless uh, yogi mm. in the Himalayan foothills who appears from time to time to people he chooses to interact with, who's hundreds of years old but looks like a young man. And the only image we have of him is the one mm -hmm. Yogananda um, guided an artist to render based on what he saw. But if, that image of, right. of Babaji that you see on their That's, altars right. is, is that artist's rendering right. based on what Yoga, how Yoga, Yogananda's descriptions and guidance. And so um, that he came to Lahiri Mahasya in a place in the Himalayan foothills that's kind of a pilgrimage place now and not far from where they have a, an ashram. And um, there's a cave that Babaji was said to live in where you, you can visit. It's not easy to get to, but you can. And um, it's maintained. And he gave Lahiri Mahasya this mission of uh, being a householder guru and making these teachings known and reviving them, uh, ancient teachings of Kriya Yoga. And then Yogananda was the anointed one to come to the West. And when he felt the calling, when he had the vision that it was time to go to the West, and he, but he started to sort of get cold feet, he needed <laughs> you know, the sort of sign that this is real and you should do it. And Someone knocked on the door at his home in Fort Garpar Road, where his uh, his uh, descendants, not his descendants, his brother's descendants live to this day. I take people on tours 
to India, like I'm doing one in September, and we'll visit that house and other places Yogananda went to and are, is associated with. Mm. And uh, so any listeners, you go to my website and you know, if you want to come with us to India. But um, he came to the door and Yogananda describes what had transpired. And, you know, he said, he said, you're Babaji, aren't you? And he said, yeah. And he said, essentially blessed the mission and said, go, you know, and you'll be, you'll be protected and you'll be safe. And this is your, this is your job. <laughs> and, you know, he wrote about it, you know, as if, you know, uh, you know, you know, Babaji lived, you know, nearby and dropped over, you know. I mean, it was more astounding to him than that, but, you know, as a matter of fact. So if that's to be believed and Yogananda didn't imagine it or make it up, we'll just take for granted that that's what happened. And he's not the only one. There are, there are people around to this day who claim to have had, you know, right. encounters with Babaji and, you know, and sometimes, and you never know because, you know, we know there's wonderful, highly evolved, authentic gurus in India, but there are also charlatans yes. and people who just want to, you know, make a buck off of tourists. And so right. anybody could say, I was with Babaji. Right. And somebody, some guru in the Himalayas could say, hey, I'm Babaji. Right. <laughs> we don't know. Do we really know? But, you know, um, so, we, you know, to be skeptical is, is uh, you know, a useful trait sometimes. Right. But... According to Yogananda and his stories, that's what happened. Well, India is a very funny place in, in that sense these days. I mean, as a friend of mine, a uh, Vaishnav who lives in Braj, calls it the abode of contradictions. You know, the 21st <laughs> century India. You know, it absolutely just... <laughs> is. But it's probably always that way. Well, I, to some extent, for sure. But I think, um, I, I mean, in, in my own uh, my opinion, what makes it so is the ecological thing, mm. is that, you know, you have this just incredible spiritual heart that is still very vibrant in India, and just the temple life and devotional yeah. life is so beautiful yeah. and so potent, but then you go out the door and everything's a disaster. Total chaos and craziness. Chaos, but they're just the, the ecological disaster, the open sewage, the water, the rivers being polluted, and the air, you can't see the sun. I mean, it's so, and it's like, how? And the crowds and the, the crowd, noise. How do you take this, all this bhakti and this love and not clean your, your river? I know. It's I like, know. how do you not connect the dots? You know, that's a Because, like people, thing. you know, and, and then you factor in the, the, the modernization and. Yes. Um, bringing modern, the modern world to a culture that's eager to modernize, yeah. but is, you know, steeped in ways uh, of, of cultural ways and um, that infrastructure ancient. that's ancient. Yeah. I mean, it's, look, Benares is this incredible city, but when you get away from the river, it's choked with noise and traffic. Because these are some awesome. of the most ancient streets in the world, and yeah. suddenly they have to accommodate automobiles and cars and, yeah. you know, a hundred times as many people as, <laughs> as it once did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, it's crazy. Plus, you throw on that hundreds of years of being uh, colonized. I mean, India's you know, modern, you know, independent India is only 70 years right, old. Right, so. yeah. still, it's still an experiment to some extent. Uh, wow. So your book, it comes out on the 24th. You can pre-order it now. What's happening in Los Angeles specifically to the book? Um, I will be doing my first L.A. gig mm -hmm. on, uh, at Tantras Yoga in West Hollywood on uh, April 15th, okay. pre-publication sort of launch um, on at three o'clock um, they can go to the t-a-n-t-r-i-s website um, then i'm doing vroman's books in pasadena on the 27th the venerable independent bookstore uh, and i'm doing a couple of events one in west la on may 3rd and uh, a yogananda fest that's being put on by the ananda uh, group on the 28th, I think. And all this is on my website, philipgoldberg.com. And then I'm going to be traveling when the book comes out. I'll be in the Bay Area. I'll be in Boston and New York and Chicago, Kripalu, for people who want to retreat. 
Wonderful. And, you know, so I've got a lot of that coming up. And uh, thanks for letting me mention it. And people can pre-order the book now instead of waiting till the 24th. And I encourage them to do that. They can go to my website and, and see how to do that. And I, I uh, created a free gift for pre-ordering the book. Right. They, um, and they can go to Amazon and do it, too. They what? They can go to Amazon and do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, if they go to my website, they'll they be able free. to get the free gift. It's just a 20-minute audio, essentially, about how to get the most out of reading the book. Because oh, there's fantastic. stuff to be learned. And I also want to mention, again, that I do get a, I get a fair bit of correspondence about people who want to go to India and where to start. You know, oh. for people who have never been. So, again... Phil mentioned uh, he leads groups in your Yeah, group. American Veda Tours. Okay. And I highly, I haven't been with Phil, but if you're looking for a group to go with, I highly recommend that because yeah, going we'll to be India. going to Rishikesh too. So. Beautiful. <laughs> awesome. Phil, thank you for joining us. Thank this. you, Zach. It's great fun to be with you. Always a pleasure. <laughs>